Good morning. I heard we got coffee, some snacks. Yeah, they put <laughs> out more bagels if y'all didn't grab a yeah. snack. So um, thanks for being here. My name is Gretchen Van Valen and I'm from Alumni Relations and I'm really pleased to introduce you to today's panel um, and it's called Tackling Student Debt Head On. So not to be daunted by that, this is really good stuff to know and to have in your back pocket and have resources you can go to as you look at that, as you face it. I had myself a lot of student debt, so I've been there and done that. Um, but I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, this morning, well, Sam Stafford over here in the car end is going to moderate the, today's panel. Uh, and uh, our next panelist is um, Suzanne Wilkins. She's the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Student Choice. And our other presenter is, I'll make sure I pronounce it right, <laughs> Brian Kunkzapliki yep. from Elmira Savings Bank. And um, they're going to talk to you about not just only like student debt, but just like thinking about how you can spend your money wisely while you have debt. Hope I have that right. You know, keep yourself secure and not to, I mean, really, I have to tell you because I've been there, done it, not to be freaked out about it, uh, but to know more and also to, um, you know, have that information so you can make some really good choices. And uh, I'm really excited to hear it because I myself have a couple students who have student loans and I can reiterate to them what they're doing. So, without further ado, thanks so much for being here and introduce you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe introduce, did you? talk about where the where, yeah. okay yeah. awesome so I had a bunch of questions that I sent you all um, so I have some questions that I was just going to ask them but I think too as we're talking about things if you have questions to those specific topics I want to uh, encourage you all to kind of talk about those topics as someone who I will say it's achievable at 31 I was able to eliminate thirty five thousand dollars of college debt. Um, I will say I have the privilege of having a partner, so that helped a little, but it is something that you can do and uh, be successful at. But, so I'm thinking about like all the loans, this is not a, uh, this is an expensive place to go to college. <laughs> so <laughs> when we're thinking about college loans, what are some basic tips can, that you can give students for tackling like multiple student loans Especially if they're thinking about going to graduate school and incurring more. Well, okay, so I think the first thing that everyone should understand is what kind of debt do you have? I mean, I know that sounds really simplistic, but a lot of people, uh, when they graduate, they don't even know. Uh, do I have federal student loans? Do I have private student loans? Are they fixed rates? Are they variable rates? So you have to really start at the beginning to really understand what you have. Knowledge is power, we all have heard of that. It really does save you money in this topic. So what I would suggest you do is go out to a couple of different websites, okay? Hopefully you have pad and pen. Um, but the first website that you have is, uh, I wanna make sure, um, nslds.ed.gov. So that's the national, um, Student Loan Data Center, okay? And uh, you should be partly familiar with it because when you fill out your FAFSA form every year for college, you need a, an FSA ID number to get into the system. Same thing, same type of system. So once you're in that system, you'll be able to see all your federal loans, all your grants, and all your scholarships. The only thing that you will not see out there is your private student loans if you have them. If you have private student loans, the, there's only a couple of different ways to find out information. If you don't have your paperwork in front of you, you can either call the financial aid office of the college that you graduated from, or you can go to annualcreditreport.com, you know that, we all know that website, where you can pull your credit reports and see what is on your credit report. So I think that that's the best way to, to start. Knowledge is power. Um. So I don't know what to add to that other than looking beyond your student loan debt or once you're in repayment. Um, I could probably sit up here and talk for the entire hour about kind of strategies and all that. So I kind of want to leave it to the questions and answers and, and organically. But suffice to say is um, read the fine print and get a free copy of Credit Bureau right away. Um, because debt is a tool want to think of it that way and a lot of times in later life um, whether it's just after graduation or you know, 20 30 years later 
um, you're going to want other things, and other people, other financial institutions are going to want to see what your character, what your capacity to, to pay is, um, and really, a lot of that is uh, defined from a credit bureau. Um, it, I lovingly call it sort of the worst, best tool we have because you know how do you tell somebody is a good person from a three-digit number? Um, you can't. Um, it's very easy to get a very high credit score. Um, there are tricks. Can everybody hear everybody? Why the back? Okay. okay. If I take some of these boxes. Good. Hello. Hey, Tom. Hello. This is on. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Not enough copy. I think the short version of this comment to add to everyone else's is just read the fine print and be engaged in the tools that you taken up. Um, that is a tool and there are ways that you can use it to swing to the next thing. Um, so you don't necessarily need to have no student on debt in order to get a house or go to grad school or anything else. How many people know kind of where they're falling with how much debt they're going to be leaving if you get college with? And do people know whether they have some federal, some private? So you all kind of Kind of have that an idea of that. Do you know what the interest rates are? Do you know when your payoff will be? Yeah, it's we're getting to feedback. <laughs> you know what? I have a lot on the forward side. There you are. How's that? So you turn that off. I turn that off. Okay, I'll put it. We'll get it. Ten fifty, right? Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Do people have any follow-up questions to yeah. kind of some yeah. of that? I see your hand. I was yeah. thinking, I'm sorry. It's okay. okay. <laughs> um, not a follow up question at all, it's just a regular question. How do you, like, like there's ways you can get rid of debt, right? Like, that pay off the forgiveness. How do you do that? Okay, so there's a couple of different ways that I would recommend. For the first and most impactful way to get rid of debt is to put extra money towards your payment. Anything will do. Now, in, when you're in the job force, make sure that whenever you get a salary increase, because most companies will give you a small salary increase every year, take that extra money, put it towards your, your monthly payments. If you get a windfall, such as an inheritance, or more realistically, the tax return, right, refund, put it on there, because a lot of times students don't realize at the beginning that um, there are no prepayment penalties on any student loans, whether it's private or federal, right? So that means you can put lump sums whenever you want, even when you are in deferment. A lot of students don't realize that once they graduate, their loans go into deferment, they don't have to pay any payments, right? If you can pay payments, pay right away, okay? Don't wait, because um, as Brian and I know, um, your loans, and I, I know that this is probably simplistic, but I think we need to start from beginning to understand how the, the interest calculates on a student loan. It's simple, it's what we call simple interest. So every time that that balance is outstanding, every day, interest gets accrued, right? Now, while you're in college, and you might have chosen deferment, right? And so you don't make any payments, so the financial institution takes that money, puts it in a bucket, so to speak, and then at the end of four years or five years, whenever you graduate, you get a not so great graduation gift because they take money out of that bucket, could be $8,000, $10,000, depending on the amount that you borrow, and then they put it on the principal balance, and then you start paying interest on interest plus the principal. That's capitalized interest, okay? So any type of extra money you can put down on that principal balance, the better off you'll be. Okay, so that's one way I think um, that, well, a couple of different ways that you can save uh, on paying that back. Now, another way that you could save is by uh, maybe refinancing your student loans. Now, how do you do that? You know, what should you look out for? Because there's a difference between refinancing your student loan and consolidating your student loan. So that's why I ask you, understand what type of loans you have. If you have federal student loans, you might not want 
to refinance with a private institution because you have a lot of federal benefits coming back to you in form of uh, income-based repayments or debt forgiveness. All that goes away if you refinance with a private institution such, such as a bank, a credit union, a finance company. Okay, so you want to make sure that you exhaust all avenues of debt forgiveness first, that you look into repayment because especially if you go into like the civil, civil service type jobs, nursing, teaching, whatever have you, you could get some really good uh, uh, debt forgiveness and if you refinance that, all of that goes away. So if, uh, another good website to go to is studentaid.ed.gov. Uh, it lists all the qualifications of debt forgiveness and repayment through the government. Please read up on that before you decide to do anything. Now, you can also choose to consolidate just your federal loans through the federal uh, government, right? The Department of Education. Um, just know that what they do is they take a weighted average, they take all of your loans and they do a weighted average, and they round it up to the nearest eight. So you might not be saving a lot of money. Your payments might be lower because they can extend it up to 30 years, but don't forget, we talked about daily interest accruing that principal balance. So any deferments, forbearances, does not stop interest from accruing. They just put it in buckets and then they extend that term out, okay? So just know that uh, consolidations could be good if you want to lower your payments to earn a decent living and to pay your bills, but at one point you should realize that maybe you should refinance into a different product, okay? Uh, because there are needs for both. I wish, um, I wish forgiveness were the appropriate term. I think it's the popular one. Um, debt forgiveness in any shape or form is in large part viewed by the IRS as taxable. So if you're planning on having a, a situation where you're a teacher in a low income environment, if you're, um, whatever the program is, tax law changes, um, student loan programs can change, things like that. Policies, um, like policies, people yeah. and politicians change. Right. So that will change. The one thing you want to be prepared for is that, you know, kind of everything in life imbalance, right? If somebody's giving you this great benefit, I would at least encourage you to give some thought or search for where's, where's if, if they're giving you an asset, where's the liability coming from? Because somebody's paying for that somewhere. Um, so you may not have to pay back $20,000 in principal, but you may have to pay back that year that you're filing the IRS. You may have to pay you know, significant chunk to the IRS. Just be okay, FYI. You know, and another good way to save um, some money is to take advantage of um, rate reductions through your servicer. Uh, a lot of times institutions offer quarter percent discount for automatic payments, and you can yep. do that. That's an easy way to save yep. a little bit of money. Or you take your monthly payment, chop it in half, and pay bi-weekly. A lot of employers pay us bi-weekly. So that way, you're paying an extra payment every year, and you're not really realizing that if you're used to just, you know, chopping something in half. So that's another way to do it, um, to save money now. Also, uh, we have something in the industry called um, the avalanche effect. Um, so it is, yeah. And I will say that's how I achieved being able to pay off my loans before that 10 year period. So I took the highest amount, like I think I came out of undergrad with about 19,000 and that was all consolidated into one and they were all federal loans. And I paid that off first. So I paid all the minimum payments on the other two loans that I had. Um, but I took that one, paid more. I kind of rounded up. So if it was like a $380 a month payment, I made it 400 when I got my first job. And so I, you know, that was just an easy way for me to tackle it. And then with, like I said, the kind of, my partner taught me a lot of this to be able to help me. Uh, but he would, as soon as we were, able to kind of pool our money together and think about it in a larger picture, we started, okay, when can we pay off this big loan, you know, off? And then when I was getting to a point where I was paying $500 a month on this loan and it was paid off, I took that $500 a month, I didn't keep it and put it in my pocket, I put it towards that next loan. And that next loan, within a year, was gone. So it, 
it's really daunting. I think five years into like paying my loans, I was like, my principal is still like so huge and I'm paying all this interest, but it goes really quickly because those last four years, it was easy, really easy to eliminate using that kind of avalanche approach. I think I explained yeah. it right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. You know, tackle your highest interest rate loans first, mm -hmm. get them out of the way. Now, to the opposite spectrum of that is the snowball effect, yeah. where you take the smaller ones and pay them off, and psychologically it makes you feel better. And so you're paying more and more and more, and you know, you're snowballing up instead mm -hmm. of avalanching down. So those are the two types of um, approaches that you could use for. Saving. Should be able to now on the annualcreditreport.com, it doesn't show interest rates. Okay. So you will have to call your servicer. You should see it on your statement. They are required by law to show it on your statement every month. Okay. Okay. I'd like to add okay. one thing to that. Um, again, just kind of a general comment about credit. <clears throat> um, how many of you know or have seen or touched one of those accordion folders? Right? Please. <laughs> Run down to Staples, spend the seven bucks or the bookstore or wherever you can get one. Usually they come in both letter and legal size. Um, get one that has more than four pockets, right? Twelve pockets, one for each month, whatever. And start tossing every single thing that comes your way that isn't junk mail. Everything you signed up for, all your tax returns, all your W-4s, your W-9s, all your I-9s and your W-4s and all that stuff, throw it in there. Because ultimately, when you want something the next time, that's not when you want to be gathering that stuff. I've worked with borrowers for, I've been in credit for, I turned eight, when I was 18, I got into credit and I turned 40 in May. I've worked in credit that entire time. I can tell you that it's the unprepared that are the victims. It's the people that are the masters of their own destiny. They're the ones <coughs> prepared. So if it's, what are my interest rates or whatever, that question, is gonna come up by a loved one, it's gonna come up by you in the middle of the night, it's gonna come up by your loan officer, it's gonna come up by uh, somebody writing you and saying your interest rate went up, somebody that's gonna contact you and say I can consolidate or refinance, and you're gonna to wanna to be able to compare. And make it easy for yourself by throwing everything in there and just stay organized. And as a follow-up to that, I keep on thinking, um, your future employers, are um, starting to open up a little bit about the employee benefits that they're giving uh, graduates. And instead of just offering 401k matches for your retirement, they're also matching your student loans. So please ask them. Ask them if they offer that program. It's, it's just starting to catch on in the upper Northeast. Um, and the more people talk about it and ask, the more uh, they'll want to give it to you. Some employers will offer one or the other, or both. Um, I, I was always taught, I've been in my, the financial industry my entire adult life, and always save for your 401k, right? Always, always, no matter what happens in life. But the reality is, is when you graduate with $100,000 worth of debt, $120,000, you're looking at me saying, yeah, right. I'm gonna save for my retirement, but I can't even, breathe because I'm underwater. Right. Well, this is another good option, okay, for you. So please, please, please ask your employer because they might or they might consider in the future doing a program like that. Chen, I think I have a couple of questions that I feel like you could kind of tackle some, especially around monthly loan payments. Um, one of the ones was how to determine how long your loan repayment will take. Well, there's tons of loan calculators on websites from financial institutions all over. So it's it's a really easy thing to do. You can go to studentaid.gov to do that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really good exercise so that you understand where your payoff date is so that you can move that needle down, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, just there's a whole wealth of money. You can even, there's an Excel formula that calculates that for you. So just, you know, download that, either figure out the Excel formula if you all are that savvy, or just download it, like Google it and say, like, Excel loan calculator. I have downloaded every time I've gotten a car, my mortgage, <laughs> anything like that. So, and it's fun because you just kind of click through and you're like, oh, but if I change the numbers, and it will do the math for you, and it shows you exactly when you can pay something off. So, again, 
I think my partner in his dorky way is to be able to help me on that. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah. So if I'm going to grad school next year, mm-hmm. I might want like defer until when I'm done with grad school because I did like choose a deferred payment. Does mm-hmm. that mean while I'm still in school, I still have to pay, or because my undergrads over, I have to start paying? If you're going to grad school, you again, it, are, do you only have federal loans? Or? I have federal and private. Okay, so you need to check with your private institutions um, because they have different rules and regulations and they might not offer deferment, um, or for, but they might uh, offer something special in school forbearance, they call it. Um, so with the government loans, not to worry, contact your servicer, they'll defer it. Your private student loans, you really have to have a conversation with them because it could vary from institution to institution. Is there any don'ts or do I mean, I think we've talked about the do's of you know paying your student loan payments, maybe don'ts of paying your student loan payments, or things that you shouldn't do. Are we all seniors in this room? No. All right. Are we all indebted? <laughs> no, I am. I'm still, I still have loans. <laughs> Hey man, it happens. It got me where I'm at today, yeah. so it's cool. Well, but, you know, the, the reason why I ask that is, um, I, okay, soapbox time. I love to get on my soapbox because I, I really feel for students today. Um, you know, an 18-year-old wouldn't walk into a bank and you wouldn't give them a promissory note for a mortgage without saying anything. That's what happens in this country with student loan debt. Because you you want to go away to college and get it the freedom the you know the ability to go out on your own and you just want to get there and, and over and you, and you sign and then at, at the end of four years you're thinking oh gosh now I have to pay now one of the things that gets the um, the, the students uh, in some trouble is surplus funding you ever heard of that where uh, you take out a student loan whether it's private or federal. And the college takes out their tuition and fees, and you might live off campus, or you might have some different extracurricular activities, that they put the funds in an account. And then they either attach it to your debit card or they give you a student card that you can access the funds. So what happens is students- I take it because I did that. Yeah, students go <laughs> to the local Starbucks, get a cup of coffee on that card. Now they're financing that cup of coffee for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years without even thinking. Now, I had to rent a car to, to drive here and you know, making small talk with this, someone that rented a car. He's, he's like, oh, you give student loans you're the bad people. You're bad. And I was like, oh, really? I'm bad. I said, well, tell me a little bit about that. I was like, I'm, I'm interested. I get that a lot, too. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, he's like, well, I have a lot of student loan debt. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, I, I do feel badly for that. And uh, he says, yeah. He says, towards the end, I owed so much that, you know, my friends and I wanted to go to a trip and take a trip to Mexico. And I said, what's a thousand dollars more? And then he put it on his student loans. Okay, so those are two extremes, right? Um, I'm not two extremes. There's one extreme, and then there's the reality of it. Yeah. You know, because you might put something um, living day to day now. Uh, another thing is, is that I, I have I'm very blessed to have two children that have graduated college. Very happy about that. And of course, me being in the finance world, I, I was always in their ear. Um, and my oldest one, typical type A personality, she did everything that she could, and she treated her trying to find out about her finances like a part-time job. So she left graduate school and undergraduate school with only $9,000 worth of debt, okay? She was very creative in how she did her financing. My youngest one, not so much, very laid back, go with the flow, she's not worried about anything, I keep poking her about deadlines, you know, all of these things. She came out of school with about $30,000 worth of debt, which is still not bad, um, because, you know, mom was poking her, but I asked both of them, I said, now that you know what you know about student loans, you're graduating, you have to pay back the debt, um, what would you have done differently when you were 18? And my oldest one said the typical type A, oh, I wouldn't have done anything because I did everything right, blah, 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 right? My youngest one looked at me and said, I wouldn't have done anything different. And I said, why is that? And she looked at me, she's like, because I wouldn't have listened to you anyway. I'm 18. 
So that, it, but that's okay. That was a really honest answer, and it really made me see, because I do this for a living, wow, we are not getting through to people when they're 18, and it's hard, you right? Uh, like, I, for the reasons I stated. But you certainly can be the master of your destiny when you graduate by learning about these things, saving money, taking, oh, that's another way, that take your tax credits or your tax deductions, right? A lot of people don't even know about that. So if you're paying interest, you can get up to $2,500 in a deduction. You could qualify for that. You could also qualify, if you're going back to school, for another tax credit of $2,500. So please check into that um, when, when you approach graduate school. You can ask Phil, since you're not in this session, he can probably talk to you about taxes. <laughs> he's oh like yeah, that's the, right. <laughs> you have a tax guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. and he's a, he's a professor at the college. Oh my god, so. that's the guy to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. Question for Sam, how much surplus do you think you just give a number? Um, so I, when graduate school, I had some of my, most of my tuition was paid for, sure. so it was like 80% tuition, and I got a room and board plus a really small stipend of 100 bucks a month. Okay. And, but they gave me, I think it was like $2,500 each year to extra in my student loans. And they just gave you a check for it. And so that just went into my checking it. And at first I was like, well, this is more than my outstanding bill. Like me being kind of naive about it. And then my friends, this is literally, I was, and this is back in the days when you actually had to go to the office and figure all these things yeah. out instead of like doing it all online or getting a check card. That's, um, and they're like, well, you'll need that for living expenses. <coughs> And I was like, well, I got my housing paid for, but I guess, you know, comfort of life so I can go out and do things. Okay. I ended up studying abroad in um, college, so the second year it kind of helped me study abroad, so I'll, I'll give it that, that like I was able to help pay for that, but I, I still get ragged by my husband. He's like, he's got all that money, he took out all those loans to go to Italy. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So we're, what was the interest rate on the student loan, do you think? Oh, God, I don't know. Two, um, three, six, eight? It's definitely higher because well, there was those were two Stafford federal loans, but so what's the, what's the interest rate? Well, it, it was right like, now so it's four point four five. Okay, so four point four five. But so back then, it's how long were you at school? Seven or eight. I was in, I no, graduated no, grad school no, ten no. years ago. Oh, so it's probably so how that's yes. no, okay. So how, how you said how much? Seven or eight percent. Okay, so seven or eight percent, right? Yeah. So on um, how long was grad school? Two years? Four years? Two years. Two, okay, so. Uh, 2500 per year or per semester? It was per year. And okay. then I took out like a $5,000. So 10 grand. Loan. So 10 grand. Yeah, yeah, like about 10 grand. Maybe even a little So bit for a two year CD, you probably could have curbed that by a percent or two? Yeah, probably. So instead of paying 7 or 8%, it could have been 6 or 7. Percent. Yeah, I could have put that. So you can find ways, interesting ways to spend that money and yeah. kind of stick it to the man, if you will. Like, uh, I you do just have to be creative about it. Yeah. So probably don't like this as a mortgage, but I do know someone who took their student loans, put it towards the down payment for a house. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, and I don't know if that's a good idea <laughs> at all, but there's... I mean, using debt to finance debt. So. Yeah. I will also say um, that it was the, in like 2008, there was all these tax, it was, it, that it was time, crazy. It was, it was the crazy tax bad. credits we were trying to get out of the, mm -hmm. that's when I graduated at the like peak of the financial crisis. So. Thank you for that way, not yeah. the mortgage meltdown. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which um, I had nothing to do with. <laughs> that's right. So I think thinking, we're kind of going into these other things, you also, while trying to pay off your student loans and live your life <coughs> to the fullest, um, you're gonna also need to save for a nest egg. Yeah. So how do you do that uh, really well? Or what are some tips that you might have for students that want to also save? Because eventually, who wants to own their own house someday? that a goal. Sometimes I feel like with your generation it's not really a goal, but I know for a lot of people that might be a goal. Um, so saving for a house or just you need to have something to fall on because emergencies happen in life. So what tips do you have for that? So I can say that from working at a um, financial institution that does a significant amount of outreach to the local and underserved public, the, the thing I can tell you that study after study shows is that income does not raise people out of poverty assets do. If you walk away with nothing from this or any college experience, that's it. If you're a business major, you may know that or in other ways, assets are what raise people out of whatever circumstances they're in. 
the interest that they earn on what they invest in, if they have stocks and bonds that mature and grow in value, regardless of what it is, you can make $200,000 a year on salary, and it's all gone. But if you start to siphon things away for a savings or for other assets, by owning a home, things like that, um, you will find that your life and your generations after you will get better. Um, that said, I think knowing what your, or at least on a regular basis, revisiting what your short, medium, and long range goals are, um, is necessary. So you asked how many people want to own a home. That may not be a goal today. Who knows tomorrow? You may move to a new city or go live with mom and dad for a while or rent or whatever. Um, whatever your goals are, make sure you're, you're confident about what those are. If you want to pay your student loans off before you do anything else, you just want your income to come in and pay the student loans off and you're looking at being free of that debt as the asset, then do that. And be 1,000% certain that you're clear with partners, family members, because these are the people that you're going to see on a daily basis. I can tell you that student, just debt in general, money is the number one reason for divorce in this country. So if you are clear about what you want to do, and I don't mean clear as in permanent, you can be clear about what you want today, and then six months from now, it's bound to change, right? Have that process in place. Because that's really going to feed, which whatever your values are, it's really going to feed your decision. So if it's starting a savings, paying a loan off, jockeying your student loans to a point on a monthly basis where you can still be in debt for student loans and buy a house, I talk to people about that every day. So ultimately it's, you know, whatever your values are will feed those decisions that you make. And then from there, you have less to worry about, less stress, more time for your own decision making in other ways. Who am I going to go out with tonight? Do I have a chance for that Starbucks? Whatever. Um, I'm confident I strayed from the actual question. Okay. <laughs> Just thinking about saving us. I know it's a, a strategy I used coming right out of grad school. And again, I had, I, for the first five years of my post-grad life, I had had my housing paid for. But I did not make a lot of money. I was making less than 30 grand a year, um, which maybe for some people sounds like a lot. But in, for those who are going into finance, it, working at some of those big fours, you, you're going to make more than that. Um, but I paid myself rent. Um, so I wasn't paying rent, but I paid myself rent every month um, just to build that nest egg. You know, I knew I wanted to buy a new car, um, stuff like that. So thinking about how can, what is that amount, even if it's little, even if it's thinking about how much you make in that bi-weekly paycheck um, that you can put towards your loans and then put towards you know, that nest egg. And one thing I found really helpful is I went to an online bank separate from my, you know, the bank that I can drive up to and take my out uh, the money in my ATM. And I got this advice from a financial uh, planner when I was an undergrad, but those were just starting to become popular. So I, I don't know what bank it was. I think it was it's some iteration of another bank account. <laughs> but I went someplace that didn't have a card attached to it. So for me, it was really easy to just store away that money and never touch it. Because when I had it where I could go to an ATM and take it out, I was often going to it and taking the money out so that I could use it um, you know, for my fun. Um, so I think that was one of the big strategies that I used that I found pretty helpful for me, especially knowing my own behavior. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you don't have to take the debit card that comes with your your account. Now they're going to push it, push it, push it because you know they earn income with that. But um, you don't have to take it. And you know, an another way, a couple of different ways to save for your nest egg is when you do get your salary increases, act like you don't and put it in your four hundred one k. A little bit over four, you know three, four, five years makes a difference, right? And then I was talking to um, a few people in the industry in this area yesterday. Um, they offer, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, this first time home buyer program where you put money in an account mm -hmm. and then you get a grant for the down payments? It's a loan. Uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank in New York, so um, stop me if you've heard this one. Um, large financial institutions, think Bank of America, right? They're, back in the 70s, the federal government passed a law, it was the 
Community, Re Community Reinvestment Act. Basically, it's a tax on uh, how popular or how, how profitable large financial institutions are. So for-profit financial institutions have to pay to this fund. The federal government sort of Robin Hoods it to the, the, federal, reserve, the, the federal home loan bank system. The federal home loan bank system, and there's a federal home loan bank in New York and Chicago and Cleveland, and, you know. Um, each of those entities the, is allowed to disperse the money however they want. And in New York, um, and it actually covers New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico, they have a first, first home club. So if you save uh, $187.50 a month for a minimum of 10 months, then the lending institution that you're working with will match that. It's, it, for, it's for home ownership, absolutely, and there's other, it's called an IDA or Individual Development Account. Basically, it's to sort of short circuit the idea that, you know, when, brick, when, when banks were, back in the old days when they were you know, marble on every surface, um, poor people can't save money, right? We all know that, right? That was an assumption. And there was a researcher that came out and said, that's totally not true. Anybody can save. Um, they just have to have a big enough care at the end of the day. And so, one way that this idea came about was the IDA or individual development account. Most every bank and credit union in New York State has access to it. It's just most of them don't care or don't know uh, or don't want to put money into it because it does take a little bit of effort. But once you get it up and running, would you like to have eight grand for pretty much free in 10 months? I would. Um, it's income based, so there's an income cap. But there's other affordable housing agencies in Ithaca and across the country. Um, so you don't necessarily need to pay cash for a house. You don't necessarily need to have 20% down for a house. But what I try to do when I meet with borrowers is really take a look at their student loan debt because uh, largely with, with the group that's here, that's what I will see you in um, you know, a few years. That, that when I pull your credit, I'll see a car payment. I'll see student loans. I may see some collections, um, medical or otherwise, but uh, ultimately, how you save is to sit down and, like I said, take a look at those values and say, you know, um, like you, you said about your two children, two, two people from the exact same family but completely different viewpoints. Um, one, just values, I just absolutely want to be out of debt. My wife was like, mm, I don't, I'm not going to grants, I'm not going to, she's in a PhD program right now. I'm not going there until all my student loans are paid off from my undergrad and masters. And she put everything on because she had no family support. So all of her undergrad and grad was on student loan. So we've waited probably about 10 or 12 years to send her a PhD. Uh, me, on the other hand, I went to a community college for two years, and then I went to, finished off at a four-year institution. I don't have a master's, and I have about 18 grand left, which is cool. I've been paying the minimum payments for all of eternity, and because I'm so close to how finance works, uh, I'm very comfortable saying, I'm gonna pay the minimums, and what does that allow me to have vacations, three kids, daycare costs, like, it eventually this stuff starts to even out and you just sort of get used to, you know, two thirds of my net pay is going out. What do I do with the other third? You know when you net out for profit after undergrad school? When you're about between the ages of 30 and 33. That's without any part-time jobs during four years, doing nothing extra. But if you make extra payments, if you work those extra hours and put money, that, that age decreases mm -hmm. so that you start earning more. That goes into your pocket or your 401k. So. Mm -hmm. Do people have questions? And they've talked a lot. So You're in the back. I have a question. Sorry, I'm the first that um, student loans have some children who are in college and have uh, loans as well. Uh, my question just for the audience. Um, how many of you have uh, a budget, mm. personal, you know, budget, sure. you know what you're bringing in, and of course you're, okay, that's really great. I did it for a long time after I graduated, and I highly encourage that you know what you have coming in, and you know what you have that's going to go out and the interest rates, and just keep it in a place, and I love that accordion minor idea, because my experience in this, I graduated a long time ago, when I was coming out of college, uh, students were being pushed to get a credit card, and then you start using that credit card to pay for gas or for some you know, food or, or repairs. Next thing you know, you've got $1,000, and you're paying, at that time, like you 
25% interest, that's money you're literally throwing away. And so just my own experience and watching what you're all coming into now compared to when I graduated, everything in this panel is talking about, I cannot highlight enough to be aware of what you have and, and know that your goals might change in five or six years. If, if any of you are thinking about buying a house now, you're like, no way. But someday you probably should because it's better money than renting for the next 15 plus years. So just that awareness is important. And lean on people who are available for you just to say, I, here's what I have. What, do you, what, what would you think the advice would do? So um, don't do what I did and just kind of like pay off my loans, minimum, forbear them, and I just you know, want to spend money on trips and things like that. You would have this great uh, array of information for you, and I can't encourage you enough to. Questions, just yeah. So yeah. I will say budget is a four word, four letter word. I, I appreciate the thought. I, I encourage people to come up with a spending plan, and that keeps it both more temporary, more more kind of I got to check in about that, and also it, a spending plan can be really consistently brought back to your values. A budget is something I at least I always saw when I, my parents were like, "You have to have a budget." The a budget is something that somebody tells you you have to have. A spending plan is something you choose to abide by. And so you're calling yourself sort of in earnest to that to that spending plan. And so if you say, I went outside of my spending plan, you can kind of justify, well, yeah, but I was, you know, I went out a little extra this, this month. Yeah, okay, that comes out of my food portion, right? Like, but a budget just always seems so rigid. I think budget is like diet, you know, people get on it and they fail and they feel terrible about it. But a spending plan is something that like, it's living, you know, you kind of keep tweaking it and fixing it and, and learning from it, and um, but you're not beholden to it, um, which is good because then the psychology behind that is, is much more positive. We have about what, six minutes left for this session. I want to make sure that you get your questions answered when it comes around, comes to like saving, debt. I was going to ask a little bit about credit, um, but we touched a little bit, I think we've touched on it. Um, credit cards, um, anything like that. So I want to give it out to the audience to ask any questions. Or is there something that they said that you didn't understand or that you were hoping to gain from coming to this this morning? No, it's early, folks. Yeah, you had to schedule the money first. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Well, I, I have a few things to say about yeah. credit. Um, again, I was talking uh, with uh, a vice president yesterday of a very large credit union and told them that I was coming here. And uh, I said, hey, do you have any words of wisdom that I could you know, share? And he said, oh, my goodness. He says, the first thing that I would share with them is how important, obviously, credit is and how, please, please, please make sure you pay your student loans or if you cannot pay your student loans, talk to your service provider and figure out a way to either get deferment or reduction in payment, whatever, whatever it takes because if it hits your credit report, future employers see it and they look not just for credit, like giving out a credit card, they look, if you're applying for a job, they're gonna pull your credit report to determine if you're a good candidate. It's, that's what they do. They pull credit reports and they look at Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, so just keep that in mind. I, don't, I also work at a. I work at a good college. <laughs> they they pull Facebook. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, I have totally yeah. done as someone on oh, the hiring right. committee. Yeah. Yeah. No, but definitely credit reports. <laughs> now they might they didn't not. make judgments <laughs> on it, but it's. I'll admit to that. You make judgments when your eyes are open, <laughs> period. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, it would watch your social media. Yeah. yeah. But they do. They do pull credit reports. Now, they might not deny it solely based on your credit report, but it gives them an idea of how you handle your finances and that transitions over into other things that they might think of. I mean, that's just the reality mm -hmm. of hiring. Else, How many of you have, heard, have sort of really delved into the concept of deferring your loans or forbearance or default? Okay. No default. No default. It happens. I know. Yeah, no default. Um, 
You're going to talk it. <laughs> the, the one thing I'll say to that is um, about keeping your goals temporal, you know, and, and really paying attention to those short and medium range goals. Long term, you know, everybody wants to be out of debt and retire and, you know, wonderful life and all that, but short and medium range, you know, if you plan on doing something like going back to grad school, buying a home, any other sort of fairly large financial decisions that you're going to be making, getting married, having kids, you know, whatever, the, the ultimate thing I'd say to all of that is know that you can, you should and, and definitely can investigate your options going forward. So if you graduate and you go into the six month deferment, right, so then you're continually adding interest to your principal. That's one aspect, but then the other thing is, you go into an income-based repayment program, and you're on that for a couple years, and then you go to try and buy a house. I'm not gonna take the income-based repayment program because that could change overnight. So all of a sudden, I take you all the way back to what were your original terms? And you go, couldn't afford it. Why do you think I'm in the income-based repayment program? And I get it, I was in one, and the thing is, when you, anticipate those financial decisions, you can go ahead and you can sort of beat the curve, you can beat that decision-making process, and, and now you can go to a loan officer's office and after being back on repayment for, let's say, uh, you know, a year or two, and now you can say, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm making payments, it's on my credit bureau, it's fully reported, it doesn't say deferred or anything, because when you're asking somebody else for money, particularly $150,000, $200,000 in one lump sum, they're gonna ask questions and they're gonna investigate. Um, other than a business loan, a mortgage is probably the most invasive financial deep dive, personal deep dive that somebody else will make in here. I mean, maybe an IRS audit. But, um, and so you want to be the master of your destiny. You want to be the, I like to call it sort of the general contractor of that. Right? So instead of going to different loan companies or whatever and saying, what do I qualify for? What do I qualify for? Um, you really want to be in control of that destiny and go to different places and say, I know I have a good score. I know I have my debt under control. I Payment, things are good. I make it. I make enough money. I have some. I pay a good rent. What do you offer? What do you offer? And that way, you know, you're on par with when you make a purchase offer for a house. You're on par with those people that just sold their house. They have plenty of money from selling that house. They've had credit for 25 years. I mean, these these decisions have a, a larger echo effect than than just the next thing. And gathering the right stakeholders and being in control of your destiny. 